Today, uh, I am uh, wanted to update the public on the homicide investigation that occurred on December 17th at 8.19 p.m. on the 1500 block of Scranton Avenue in Clearwater. Um, I want to synopsize a little bit of what, what happened and then what we know to this day. So, the uh, victim, who you can see in the photo off to my right here, Elizabeth, uh, was traveling with her family in a Nissan Sentra, a red four-door vehicle. Um, they had just picked up her younger brother at St. Cecilia's Church, and they were taking her brother home. In her car was her husband, Javier, and, uh, and Javier's daughter as well. They were traveling westbound on Woodlawn, and as they approached the intersection of Woodlawn and Scranton, a white vehicle backed out of the residence at uh, on Woodlawn and Scranton, the, the house that's on the southeast corner of that intersection. Uh, that white vehicle then proceeded to turn south on Scranton, and uh, the uh, Elizabeth and Javier and their family were traveling in the same direction. They were behind this white vehicle, which slowed and approached a speed bump that is located kind of in the front of 1515 Scranton Avenue in that particular area. Um, Javier, when the vehicle slowed, went to go around the vehicle, a very natural, normal reaction for any reasonable person to do. And as he drove past that vehicle, shots were fired out of that white Buick from the rear, passenger, or rear driver's seat. And one of those bullets struck Elizabeth in the head and she passed away. Javier got his family to a position of safety and called the police department. And from that day forward, the Clearwater Police Department detectives have been working tirelessly to give this family some closure. From the <coughs> investigative work done by the detectives and some cooperative citizens, we have learned now these particular facts that Mr. Charles Groucho Allen who is the owner of the Buick that I referenced, the 2007 Buick Lucerne, the white four-door, was in the left rear, pass, or left rear seat of this Buick. It was being driven by another individual. Mr. Allen has uh, got a history of drug sales, drug possession, and drug use, and uh, was acting extremely paranoid and for some illegitimate reason came to the conclusion that he thought he was being robbed. He had some form of a weapon at this time we believe to be a high-powered rifle that he used to shoot into Javier's car and kill his wife, Elizabeth. The injury was fatal and graphic and very difficult, I am sure, for the family to see. Mr. Allen then in cooperation with the person who was driving the vehicle, left the area. Many of these people I'm referencing are cooperating with us, except for the, app, the, the uh, Mr. Allen. Officers have located the vehicle. They have located several witnesses that are able to corroborate these facts. Mr. Allen had given us an initial statement that night that he went in a completely dis a different direction, which the detectives have completely discredited that statement. There is no doubt in my mind that Mr. Allen is the offender and he is currently upstairs and we will be making arrangements for him to go to jail. Mr. Allen is going to be charged with two felonies, two capital murder charges, first degree murder. There is a statute, 78209, that uh, allows for um, this particular second count of murder because in this terrible situation, Elizabeth was approximately three and a half months pregnant. From there, uh, there is a lot of work still to be done. The investigators are still not uh, concluded with all the work that they have to do. There's been a, a lot done so far, but we are still looking for the weapon. And as stated uh, earlier, you know, we believe that to be a high-powered rifle. So therefore, we are still asking for the help of the public. If you are familiar with Mr. Charles Groucho Allen, he goes by Groucho. He also goes by uh, Charles Gooden. If you have seen him with a weapon or aware where this weapon is or have 
at any particular time any knowledge of him in possession of a rifle or any other weapon, we would like to talk to you. And we are enlisting the assistance of the Crime Stoppers in our own tip line to make those portals available for those who wish to assist us in those efforts. Uh, as I said, Mr. Uh, you know, Javier is here today. Uh, he does not want to talk. It's been very difficult for this family. I think we all can recognize the time of year. Uh, but um, this agency is working tirelessly to give this family closure. I'd like to commend some of my employees. Sergeant Tim Downs, the leader of our homicide unit. Detective Michael Beaver is off to my left here, who is the case agent in this particular case. But there's also some really good boots on the ground work that was done by our regular patrol officers. One of our officers, Kurt Henschel, had a uh, strong relationship with many people in the community because he works that particular geographic area and has done for some time. And we challenge our officers to act like their individual chief of police in that little geographic area. And he was able to make contact with several people and, they, and helped us get a lot of information that proved to be very valuable. Uh, but I couldn't list every employee because um, this one impacted us and um, everybody pulled together and got the work done. And I'd be more than happy to try to answer any questions. Chief, can you tell us about how this arrest went down? Sure, I it was, um, you know, how the arrest went down, uh, let, me, let me put it in this sense, you know, we were, um, in the way these homicide cases work quite often, um, you know, you have some information and you're trying to follow the evidence, um, but there tends to be some situation that just kind of automatically the stuff starts to, starts to break and then it's moving really fast. Um, we located uh, a very key witness uh, and uh, from that witness uh, we were able to identify uh, somebody who had very direct knowledge um, and uh, uh, somebody who was fearful of this individual who now they do not have to worry about him because he will not see the light of day for a while. And from that information, we were able to glean the supportive testimony that's necessary to corroborate a lot of the facts that we already had. Uh, from that point, we uh, you know, began our efforts to, uh, to arrest Mr. Mr. Allen and uh, basically st did a stakeout until we got him. Was it, was it peaceful? It was a uh, give up, surrender? No, he, he, he acted like a clown. Uh, you know, he uh, was laying down and doing some goofy stuff in his car, and he's quite honestly lucky based on the facts and circumstances of this case that he didn't get shot. So our officers showed great restraint. And, um, but uh, ultimately, they did get him in custody, and as I said, he is upstairs. Chief, this was a crime that outraged the community. How much did the community's tips, uh, how, how did that help your investigation? making this arrest? It was extremely helpful. There, there are people that are close to Mr. Allen that uh, were sharing information with us that, is, that proved critical. And there are people in the community that shared information that proved critical. And so, uh, you know, all of these cases are really built by taking a totality of the evidence and, and little pieces here and there. Uh, but each one of those pieces came from uh, a lot of the cooperation with the public. I think you're right on the mark when the circumstances of this one were just intolerable and people had enough of it and they weren't going to allow him to be free. And you kind of touched on this, but there is no doubt in your mind that this is the guy? Absolutely no doubt. The evidence, I believe, once it's, uh, you know, it has to play out in a particular form and I would love to share every piece of it with you today, but I am extremely confident with the testimony that we've gathered from the witnesses uh, that we have a, a case that is extremely strong and uh, the only thing we'd like to do is uh, enlist that uh, help of the public so we can locate that weapon. Chief, you were talking about um, motive, that he would thought that someone was trying to take something that he had. Any more on the motive behind this? It seems just so bizarre. Unfortunately, when people are involved in illicit activities like selling drugs, um, they get worried at times uh, for two reasons. You know, they, do, they get ripped off for drugs or money, uh, but also sometimes when they use their own product, uh, it has a, uh, an effect on them and makes them paranoid. And so I believe it was a little bit of both of those scenarios. He's uh, involved in an activity that, quite honestly, is, is uh, dangerous. And uh, based on his arrest history, hasn't learned his lesson. And uh, so at this point, I think incarceration for the rest of his life or something even worse uh, makes sense. Speaking of his arrest, he's got a long list of arrests and felonies. And it begs the question, why was he still, he just got out of March, why was he out on the street? You know, he got out of March, but he did seven years, so, you know, I think those are other social questions. Uh, as a police department, we're more of an implementator. We implement policy. We don't make it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think those are questions that are appropriate for certain people to ask in the right forum. And Chief, um, looking at his extensive 
criminal history as we were discussing. Are you guys able to look into any other open cases, drug related, uh, violent crime related, and possibly tie him to anything else now that you have him in custody? Um, I will say I, that always happens. Whenever you have an arrest, you always try to look at what is unsolved that might kind of fit the fact pattern, the, the MO, or even the descriptions and all that stuff. So yes, I think we will look at those things as will other agencies in our jurisdiction. And I don't think this is going to be the only charge you're going to see fall on this particular gentleman. They mentioned that he was not the gun with, with such an extensive arrest history. I'm sure that there is no way that he obtained this gun in a legal manner. I have no idea how he got it at this point. I'd like to find the gun, so that those are some of the answers that I can give you and the public and the family. You mentioned that he wasn't truthful about what happened that night. What did he tell you from, that he said happened? Well, originally he had given a statement that he went a totally different direction, which we knew to be false based on statements from his own family and, the, and of course, Mr. Javier's family. When was he arrested and where? This afternoon at his place of business. I don't have the address of the place of business, but he works at some cleaner's place. Um, and he's where? He's upstairs right now. Did he, did he explain or was there a reason why he was there and stopped that night? Yeah, he's, the, the, the location that he was in, he's, his, uh, his daughter lives in that particular area. His daughter wasn't with him when this incident happened, but um, he was returned in her home and they live in that particular area. He was really lucky that no one else in this car was shot. He had a very high-powered weapon. Do you know how many times he actually opened fire when they drove past? We're not, in a, we're not going to share that information as far as how many times he opened fire, but I think your, your point is extremely valid. Um, there's a difference. Okay, you should never fire a handgun into a car. There's no excuse for that. But I don't think that everybody realizes the, the, um, the, how deadly these rifles are. I mean, we are talking about a, a piece of equipment that has the ability to penetrate vehicle doors through people, through our bulletproof vests. We're not talking about a, a, a light piece of equipment. And so, um, yes, I think, you know, if it, it, it's, I don't want to you know, disrespect Javier's family by saying that they were fortunate, because I don't think they were, um, but it could have been worse. Chief, you said that he's not being cooperative. Without getting into specifics, has, has he lawyered up or did he just say, I, I, I didn't do it? Hey, in my mind, cooperative either means you, you admitted the truth or you didn't, and I don't think he's telling the truth. So that's about the best I can say. Um, you know, has he, has he lawyered up or something? They're still up there. They were trying to talk to him when I left. I, I wasn't, you know, in there at that particular time. But he, he's not, he's not uh, taking responsibility for killing a pregnant wife of a family member. I'm not familiar with the statute. I know in other states the charge of manslaughter for a fetus in terms of the viability of life outside of the womb. Does that come into play with this charge here? No, ma'am. Not in the state of Florida. 78209 is the statute. If you'd like to look it up, I actually had it on a pamphlet for Joelle to give you as well, so you can look it up. Uh, and it really just uh, talks about if you kill the mother and the fetus, therefore, doesn't have the ability to have any type of opportunity to survive. That's enough in the state of Florida. I know it's a sad circumstance here, but uh, looking at his uh, arrest record in his past, happy to get this man off the streets. Of yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would have been happy probably even before this happened, and I think, uh, you know, I, I surely you know, wish that's something I could have done for Javier and his family, but we're going to do it now. All right. Is there anything else? I really appreciate everybody's attendance today, and if you uh, have any other specific questions you want to do individually, I'm more than happy to try to do those. Thank All you. Right.